Grandpa Pearl and Grandpa Roy. Yes. Had four children. Yes. So here's a picture of mm -hmm. the four siblings with Grandma Pearl. Yes. So she watched all of her children die. You can't see it in their eyes. Back then, they didn't know about the cruel genetic destiny that awaited them. The three brothers were hospitalized and the sister committed suicide. Yes. In Niagara-on-the-Lake, Vicki Poirier and her daughter Tam know all about the shadows that darken their family story, the tremors. His gait was very pronounced. The depression and death. He was hospitalized. It wasn't until Uncle Max was officially diagnosed that the family learned about the fault running through their genes, the 50-50 chance of inheriting the mutation that causes Huntington's disease. Once that came to light, then a lot more things made sense in the family. There's you. Now in her early 60s, Vicki Poirier has Huntington's too. This is uh, my grandmother and my grandfather. And it turns out that the Huntington's gene came from him. The previous um, generations... What about Vicki's daughter, Tam? The question hangs in the air. There is no they cure for Huntington's. Uh, Tam has decided not to get the genetic test. My take on it is that if there was a treatment, I would definitely get tested so that I could get treatment. Since there's not right now, um, I just don't want to know that I have it. I just want to, you know, live my life normally and not worry the next time I drop my keys if, you know, um, symptoms are starting. So you just go on with life. Like, what else are you going to do? Cure it. Sounds like <laughs> yeah. what you're trying to do. <laughs> yeah. So then you go to the lab every day and work on, on trying to find a treatment. Tam is fighting back against the Huntington's curse with science. At a lab at McMaster University in Hamilton, she spends her days searching for a way to repair the Huntington's mutation. Joining scientists around the world who are probing the depths of the human genome, looking for ways to fix genetic disease. And there's a buzz in the air these days as lab after lab begins to experiment with a new way to edit genes. The tool is called CRISPR. It lets scientists rearrange the building blocks of life. Removing one gene, adding another, manipulating DNA with unprecedented ease and precision. And the CRISPR excitement is building around the world. Uh, meeting in Rome and there was a presentation and a guy just knocked our socks off. Uh, it was just all of a sudden you're just sitting there and going, oh my goodness, what, what I could do with that. So I'd like to show you my lab. What Elizabeth like Simpson is trying to do is cure genetic blindness in children. And to do that, the Vancouver geneticist has built the gene mutation into mice. So that is the sign of... The mice have been engineered to develop the same disease as a child with the same genetic mutation. Okay. So that's a normal. Yeah, exactly. So that's what a normal mouse eye would look like. All right, so if I put her back and I see if I can find her sister that has a mutation. Okay, so here we go. Oh, so you can see right away mm -hmm. that the eye itself is quite a bit smaller. Mm -hmm. And if we get a really good close-up shot, you'll actually be able to start seeing in the light um, that there's a whiteness over some of the eyes, particularly on this right eye here. So is that most blind? Uh, it's not completely blind, but it's much closer. It's very vision reduced. And our hope is that by correcting the genetic defect that these mice are born with, that we can actually restore the normal eye shape and function. If they can reverse the blindness in the mouse, in theory, they should be able to do the same thing in a child. So far, it's worked. In the mouse, that is. We restored vision in a mouse model of blindness, and we are thrilled. And that is a really good example. We hope that that will get, make its way to children with those kinds of blindness. It's and she believes CRISPR will help her make it happen. Science is like this. It doesn't go smoothly, it jumps. And this is a jump, this is a game-changing jump. Although humans have been manipulating DNA for decades, the older systems are cumbersome and inaccurate. 
few years ago, scientists borrowed a tool from bacteria. They called it CRISPR. Like a pair of genetic scissors, it can be used to rearrange the DNA of any organism on the planet. And to me, if somebody does get the Nobel Prize, it's the guy, the person who went, aha, this isn't just interesting in the original organism. This is a tool. I could, I could use this. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. How important is CRISPR? I think it's the most important thing I've ever encountered in my scientific and clinical career. At Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, Dr. Ronald Cohn believes CRISPR might hold the key to repairing genetic diseases. <laughs> so then there's a good chance that we yeah. see a duplication. Yeah. I became mesmerized by this technology and by the potential options. I pulled my lab together. Very exciting. Okay. That was now almost two years ago when I changed completely the direction of what my lab has been focusing on. So CRISPR changed your research completely? Completely. Right now, Dr. Cohn and his research team are working with the cells of a 13-year-old boy named Gavriel. He has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a genetic mutation that has already cost him the use of his legs and will eventually leave him unable to move. So far, Dr. Cohn has used CRISPR to fix the genetic mutation in Gavriel's cells in a Petri dish. So it's a very personal, scientific endeavor for me. And when you think about the fact that we have now been able, after I've known this boy for eight years, to correct his genetic duplication, provide full-length dystrophin in his muscle cells in my Petri dish, and I'm now in a position to move the science forward to actually create potentially a medication that could help him one day. There cannot be anything more powerful to a scientist or a physician to begin tackling these problems. The challenges are daunting. The researchers will have to figure out how to deliver CRISPR safely in a way that will get into Gavriel's cells and correct the genetic mistake in the living boy. And the potential risks are enormous. As exciting as it is, I think that we all need to put the brakes on for ourselves to make sure that we don't move ahead of ourselves. How fast should science be allowed to move? Now that researchers have the technical ability to alter the genetic material of any plant or animal with ease and precision, a development that's both thrilling and unsettling, partly because CRISPR is cheap and easy for anybody with basic training in microbiology. concerned about people who will hear about this technology, who have the financial means to tell the company, said, can you please create a CRISPR drug and make me more muscle, make me smarter, make my eyes green. Eventually it's all going to be technically feasible and I think that's why we need to put a bit of a framework here in place so this doesn't get out of control. Already, CRISPR has been used to genetically alter human embryos. In April, a Chinese team reported on their effort to use CRISPR to edit a gene for a genetic blood disease. It's a move that alarmed many in the scientific community. And it added new urgency to an unprecedented summit of scientists from around the world. What For three days in Washington, scientists, philosophers, and patients wrestled with the new reality. Yes, as someone who has started to decipher the, the, the CRISPR-Cas9 mechanism, I feel very much concerned of, of the future uh, usage of, of this uh, technology. And I'm the mother of a child who uh, died because of a fatal birth defect. He was six days old, and um, he suffered. Every day, if you have the skills and the knowledge to fix these diseases, then freaking do it. But in the end, the scientists said, not yet. It's too soon to edit the genome in a way that could be passed on to future generations. Back in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Vicky Poirier considered the same question. 
And what would you say to scientists as they're struggling with making these decisions? Take it slow and um, steady. That's about it. What about her grandchildren? Do they have the Huntington's mutation? No one knows. Tam approaches that risk as both a mother and a scientist. For my kids, all I can do is just hope that by the time that they're affected by that, that we will have a treatment, and I'm working hard to make sure that happens. <laughs> if gene editing turns out to be the solution for Huntington's disease, of course, you know, we want to be able to use it for that. How do you balance, you know, putting the brakes on research that can have huge ethical implications and huge safety considerations? How do you balance that with the desperation of, we just need a therapy. But don't stop working on the other stuff that might get there quicker. Although the conversation is just getting started, CRISPR is already out of the box. Scientists are already using it to build unprecedented possibility, and at the same time, uncertain risk. Kelly Crow, CBC News, Toronto.